Welcome, friends. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me, and let's give God the glory today, because God is good and loving. Let's give thanks and praise to God for all that he has done for us. In our poverty, he has made us rich. In our weakness, he has made us strong. In our sin, he has saved us. And as we are reminded of God's great faithfulness to us and our sometimes herky-jerky faith and unfaithfulness, let's begin today by confessing our sins together. Oh God, sometimes we take ourselves so seriously, our own opinions, our emotions, our needs, our sense of entitlement. We think about those things and fail to notice our effect on others. We don't make connections between our wants and the resources left for others, for what they need in this life. So forgive us, God, of our lack of awareness. Awaken us to justice for the common good of all people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news from the book of Colossians. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. My friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven people. Thanks be to God. And with this wonderful salvation, with this peace that we enjoy personally, we therefore extend it freely to one another. And so may the peace of Christ be with you as well, my friend. There is nothing between us and God in Christ and now nothing between each other. As we approach the scriptures today, let's again pray and ask for the Holy Spirit's help. O oh, blessed Spirit of God, as the scriptures are read and the gospel proclaimed today, open our ears to hear your word. Open our eyes to see your truth. Open our hearts to receive your grace and lead us into the ways of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Today I'm going to, <clears throat> excuse me, time for a cup of coffee today. I'm going to read for you, back in the Old Testament in one of the Minor Prophets, the book of Amos, chapter 8, and verses 1 to 12. Listen to God's word today. This is what the Sovereign Lord showed me, a basket of ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? he asked. A basket of ripe fruit, I answered. Then the Lord said to me, The time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. In that day, declares the Lord, the songs in the temple will turn to wailing. Many, many bodies flung everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy, and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market wheat, skimping on the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat? 
The Lord has sworn by himself the pride of Jacob. I will never forget anything they have done. Will not the land tremble for this, and all who live in it mourn? The whole land will rise like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious festivals into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine throughout the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Well, that is the word of the Lord to us today. We can say thanks be to God <laughs> together. I've been in the church most of my life. I've listened to thousands of sermons. And I've preached even more. <laughs> and I can count on both hands how many times I've heard a sermon from one of the 12 minor prophets in the Bible although I have personally preached on them more times than that, it still pales in comparison with how many sermons I've preached from the New Testament Gospels or Epistles. And maybe that makes sense to you after I just read this scripture for today. It's not exactly all um, butterflies and unicorns. But this lack of attention toward a very large chunk of Holy Scripture, I believe, is an, an indictment on us, especially those who enjoy privilege and power. If you add the major prophets, we have 16 books contained in Holy Scripture, calling out powerful and influential people's oppression of others. To overlook such a girth of text is to really do nothing but stick our fingers in our ears la, 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 and refuse to listen to God on this. Those with power, position, and privilege must continually be vigilant to use that influence for the benefit of all persons, for the common good of all people, not just themselves or people who are just like them. The books of the prophets make it very clear that God cares about justice. God will uphold the needy. The Lord will stand with the oppressed. If we fail to share a divine sense of justice and injustice, well, there literally is hell to pay. Now, God is long-suffering. He is very patient with us. And he patiently awaits for us to pay attention. Yet, eventually, that patience will run its course. A prophet will be sent to voice God's concerns. Like a basket of ripe fruit now finally ready to be eaten, so God's justice is ripe, and it's ready for action. The prophet Amos delivered, <laughs> as you can tell, that, that was just, a small portion out of his entire prophecy. Amos delivered a scathing message to the ancient Israelites about their total disregard for the poor and needy in the land. The people in positions of authority and power only looked on the less fortunate as commodities, 
as pawns to be taken advantage of for the rich merchants. Because the wealthy never took the time to listen to the poor, God would not listen to them. Judgment was coming. And it wouldn't go so well for the power brokers of society who only thought of their business dealings and squeezing others for more money. Few people rush to have poor folk as their friends. Those in poverty are often overlooked and they are disregarded. Either they are ignored altogether or are given handouts and services without ever having any significant human contact. Even when there is help, it tends to come from a distance. In other words, those in authority rarely take the time to listen and get to know the real face of poverty. If there isn't a photo op, then encounters with the poor are not likely to happen with politicians or anyone else. After all, so many are busy making money, checking stock portfolios, considering how to get bigger market shares. <laughs> oh, my friends, perhaps we have an answer here as to why there is no revival in the land. God shows such solidarity with the poor that to ignore them is to ignore God. No matter what our financial picture and outlook, every one of us can grace the poor with the gift of time and listening. For in doing so, we might just be listening to the voice of God. Justice is the responsibility of everyone, not just a few. And it is to take place both on the personal level and the systemic level. Justice is to be infused throughout all of life. God identifies closely with the poor, the distressed, the underprivileged, the needy. The Lord listens to the lowly. So we as God's people are to share this same concern. It is a theme throughout the entirety of Holy Scripture. This is not just something that gets mentioned once in a great while throughout Scripture. It is replete throughout. And I'm going to share with you just a few of the many, many Scriptures in Holy in the Bible. From the Old Testament, Psalm 73, verses 12 to 13. God will rescue the needy person who cries for help and the oppressed person who has no one's help. He will have pity on the poor and needy and will save the lives of the needy. Proverbs 17.5 says, Those who mock the poor insult their maker. Those who rejoice at the misfortune of others and do this schadenfreude thing will be punished. Proverbs 19.17 those who are gracious to the poor lend to the Lord, and the Lord will fully repay them. Did you catch that? <laughs> Maybe I should say that one again. Those who are gracious to the poor are actually lending to the Lord, and then the Lord will fully repay them for their grace. Proverbs 21.13 says, If you close your ear to the cry of the poor, you will cry out, and you will not be heard. Proverbs 28.27 Those who give to the poor will lack nothing. <laughs> There's a piece of pie for everybody, my friends. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing. But those who turn a blind eye will be greatly cursed. Isaiah 58.10 Give your food to the hungry and care for the homeless. Then your light will shine in the dark. Your darkest hour will be like the noonday sun. And Isaiah 61.1 
quoted also by Jesus in the New Testament. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. And from the New Testament, speaking of Jesus, Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said, If you want to be complete, go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 18 warns us, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And the Apostle John said, in his first epistle, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. If we are rich and see others in need, yet close our hearts against them, how can we claim that we love God? There's that solidarity with the poor again that God has. My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love, which shows itself in action. Folks, poverty is not only an issue in some faraway place. The poor are found everywhere, and they are always among us. I believe an honest hearing of the prophet Amos would change the world. And I'm not talking about any angry ranting which works people into a frenzy of fear and suspicion. I am referring to giving Amos a serious hearing, just like we give the Apostle Paul our focused attention. Just because poverty has always been with us doesn't mean we ought to only shrug our shoulders and say, eh, what's a guy to do? Instead, we can determine to address the issues which create a large class of poor people to begin with, including malevolence and material materialism that happens at both the personal level and the systemic level, at both uh, the family and in the church, as well as in human institutions and governments. That inattention is everywhere. The moral compass of many of the Earth's nations is just off. It's askew. It's even broken. It needs to be recalibrated to the true north of biblical justice. Back in the prophet's day, bullying, bribery, backstabbing, those were the tools used for malevolent purposes, to seek to do harm to another for personal benefit those same implements are still being used today by some. Deuteronomy 16, 19 says, You must not pervert justice or show favoritism. Do not take a bribe, for bribes blind the eyes of the wise and distort the words of the righteous. Proverbs 22, 8 says, Those who plant injustice will harvest disaster and their reign of terror will come to an end. But why in the world would people be so unjust to other people and take advantage of them in that way? What would motivate someone to purposefully harm another? Actually, materialism would. Whenever people have an exorbitant amount of stuff generosity is typically not their first impulse. Rather, the extremely rich among us have an equally extreme temptation <clears throat> to hold on tight to their wealth. So much so that money and acquiring more stuff becomes their religion. That's why scripture is so replete with warnings about money. Poverty must be tackled. 
from a biblical perspective on both the personal and systemic levels. Individuals, families, churches, faith communities, organizations, corporations, governments, we must all remove the obstacles which keep people in poverty. That's an appropriate use of power and authority. So what will you and I do? Oh, gracious God, you are found everywhere, both the halls of power and the back alleys of slums. As we seek you more and more, help us to see the face of Jesus in everyone we encounter, whether rich or poor, so that we might share the gift of life with them through Jesus Christ our Lord in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for being with me today, friends. Thank you for your attention to the poor and needy. And we thank God for taking up the concerns of needy people. God has showed us perfectly through Jesus that um, he is love. He welcomed us, dirt and all. He gathered us together despite our sin and despite our poverty and gave us a place, a prominent place, a power, a privilege, a position. And in that position, we are to freely use our privilege and our power for the sake of those who don't have it. Therefore, I send you out with a blessing from God to go out into the world and to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all in your ministry, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, brothers and sisters. Go in peace to love God, and to serve others. Amen.